Mary's fields and forests and along her streams are wild creatures infrequently noticed by the casual observer. Most of them are beneficial to man and all play an important role in nature. Among them are snakes and probably no animals is so widely misunderstood. Many are the false stories told about them. For example, this hog-nosed snake is thought to be deadly poisonous and is known by a number of formidable names. Actually, harmless as can be, its only defense is to put up a big bluff, spreading its neck and making all sorts of threats, but it almost never bites. When its bluff is called, the hog nose resorts to his one remaining trick. He writhes and squirms in apparent agony and certainly looks dead. But let's watch him. Maybe he's just playing possum. Now look, he's not dead. Very slowly he twists his head and begins to right himself. He takes his time, plenty of it. He checks around to see whether or not the coast is clear. His trick is working. Soon he'll be gliding off to safety. A poisonous snake will try to defend itself too, but won't waste time and breath on such clowning. So if you can't tell whether or not a snake is poisonous by its defensive antics, just how do you tell them apart? Well, let's take a dangerous snake like this timber rattler and compare it with a good example of the harmless type. Like this prairie king snake for a reliable means of distinguishing between poisonous and non-poisonous snakes. All snakes have nostrils. And all have eyes. But notice the vertical cat-like pupil of this rattler. And this depression or pit about halfway between the nostril and the eye. All the poisonous snakes of Missouri have this peculiar feature. Hence, they are aptly called pit vipers. Examining our non-poisonous king snake again, there's the nostril. But notice that there is no depression or pit between the nostril and the eye. All our harmless snakes have round eye pupils like this, quite different from those of the pit vipers. The hollow fangs of a pit viper fold back against the roof of its mouth. As it strikes, the fangs are thrust forward and venom is forced through them from glands located in the head. This is one fang and its replacement. Duplicates are on the opposite jaw. A poisonous snake cannot be rendered harmless by pulling out its fangs. A spare is always ready. Let's look inside the mouth of a harmless blue racer. Unlike the poisonous snakes, there are no fangs in the roof of the mouth. Only small, sharp teeth along the snake's upper and lower jaws, with which it can, and does, bite. Bites from non-poisonous snakes generally leave a row of tooth marks or a series of scratches, and unless they become infected, have no serious physical results. Poisonous snakes can also be told from harmless ones by the underside of their tails. In the case of a pit viper, the plates along the entire underside of the body are not divided. This happens to be the button on the tip of a rattler's tail. On non-poisonous species like this grass snake, the undersurface plates down to the anal opening are not divided. But from the opening to the tip of the tail, they are divided, quite unlike those of Missouri's poisonous snakes, which are undivided throughout. Largest and probably the most dangerous of our five poisonous snakes is the timber rattler. This pit viper is found throughout the state, but mostly in the Ozarks, along limestone outcroppings, ravines, bluffs, and streams. Like most other snakes, its color varies with its habitat, but the timber rattler is commonly a light brown with a series of darker brown or black wavy crossbands bordered by cream or yellow. This sound, once heard in the wild, is never forgotten. Each time the snake sheds his skin, this rattle acquires a new segment, probably two or three a year. These are easily broken off, so you can't tell the age of a snake by the number of its rattles. 
Old deadpan here looks sleepy, but he's plenty alert, cold and calculating, only he knows where and when he'll launch his attack. Ordinarily, he uses his poison apparatus to kill his prey. Very rarely will a rattler strike a person unless molested. If you meet one, leave it alone. Remember, he doesn't always telegraph his punches. A timber rattlesnake will defend itself when provoked, but nearly always will retreat if given an opportunity. The smallest of the three rattlers that occur in Missouri is the pygmy rattlesnake, sometimes called a ground rattler. He's rarely longer than two feet and has a grayish-blue background. Rusty red blotches alternate with black ones along the back and sides. He has a rattle and uses it, but the ornament is so tiny it can hardly be heard. It's less than a quarter of an inch long. This little pit viper ranges south of the Missouri River in the Ozarks and mostly towards the southwestern part of the state. It prefers dry, rocky hillsides. While the least dangerous of our poisonous snakes, it should not be treated with contempt. Last of the three rattlesnakes found in Missouri is the Massasauga. It averages a little more than two feet in length. Dark blotches on the side and back lie against a light bluish-gray background. A prominent dark band extends through part of the eye. He's not striking, so his fangs are hidden by a muscular sheath. His rattle is slightly larger than the pygmies, and his buzz is much louder. However, this character doesn't choose to sound off. All rattlesnakes are temperamental in this respect. They buzz only when they feel like it. So don't count on their warning you of their presence by buzzing. The Massasauga is found mostly in the wet prairie section of the state, north of the Missouri River, and possibly on the southwest prairies too. All snakes have tongues forked ones, and the tongues of all snakes are entirely harmless. They do not contain a sting. However, the snake uses its tongue as an aid in smelling. Number four among our poisonous snakes is the copperhead. Robust and handsomely marked, he's usually less than a yard long. Found throughout the state, his habitat is similar to that of the timber rattler. But in some parts of Missouri, the copperhead is commonly found in the bottomlands and along streams. It's easy to understand why he's called copperhead. His eyes resemble those of a cat in daylight. The vertical pupil and the pit identify this specimen as poisonous. The copperhead is a master in the art of camouflage, with a color pattern remarkably like sunlight falling on dead leaves. His ground color varies from a grayish brown to a light tan, and on this is laid a pattern of rich chestnut cross bands. When looked at from above, they suggest the outlines of hourglasses, except where they do not meet. Fifth and last of the poisonous snakes in Missouri is the cottonmouth, or water moccasin, another member of the pit vipers. This species is common to the southeastern lowlands of Missouri, occasionally found in the Ozarks, and may rarely be encountered north of the Missouri River in the central part of the state. In the wild, this snake frequently stands his ground when molested, opening his mouth in a threatening gesture and showing the puffy white interior. That's where he gets his name. The cottonmouth is thick and sluggish and averages about three and a half feet in length. It is generally dark on top, light underneath, with an indistinct pattern of irregular wavy cross bands and blotches, each narrowly edged in white. These patterns become obscure or disappear completely in large specimens, leaving them almost uniformly black. This snake is a medium-sized adult, 
Therefore, he still has rather distinct markings. All snakes must have water to drink, and the aquatic cottonmouth is no exception. He drinks something like a horse, lowering his nose and sucking up the water by rhythmical throat contraction. You've seen our five really dangerous snakes. The Cottonmouth, Copperhead, Massasauga, Pygmy Rattlesnake, and the Timber Rattlesnake. Now let's look at a few of the 37 kinds of non-poisonous snakes found in Missouri. This harmless garter snake is out to rustle up some grub, and he senses a young frog nearby. The little frog is quite alert and tries to escape, but too late. With a rush and a quick lunge, the snake overtakes him. Now you may feel sorry for the frog, but this is a natural phenomenon which should be understood. For after all, it is nothing more than the old everyday struggle for existence and one of nature's methods of seeing to it that no one species overruns the earth. Snakes eat animal food only and without the help of hands, they nearly always have to catch, hold, and swallow it alive. But they're well equipped. Rows of tiny hooked teeth along their jaws can easily maintain a sure hold, even on a slippery frog. Snakes generally nab the heads of their victims to make things easier for themselves. But this one barely managed to grab a leg. Before he can completely swallow his quarry, he has to grasp both of the frog's legs. But once this is accomplished, he's really ready to get on the outside of a good meal. He actually does crawl around his prey. Each side of the jaws moves separately, so a snake can hold an animal with one side of its mouth while moving the other side to take a new grip. Strong juices in the snake's stomach and intestines digest such food, bones and all. A meal like this may last him for at least a week, but he might eat two or three such portions at one setting. Those of us who enjoy an occasional mess of bullfrog legs can appreciate his appetite. Here's another harmless hog-nosed snake. Those that live in dry open places are usually yellowish brown like this one. Those that live in moist, wooded areas are likely to be much darker. They get their name from the upturned, swine-like snout. Frequently hiding under old logs and rocks and traveling mostly at night, the harmless red milk snake is seldom seen, but he is not rare. A brilliantly colored animal, he has a series of red saddle markings edged in black against a light background. Sometimes this snake is confused with the poisonous coral snake, which does not occur in Missouri. The milk snake is a member of the beneficial king snake group, all of which are immune to the venom of our poisonous snakes. The milk snake does not milk cows, but does feed on mice and small rats. The harmless salt and pepper king snake prefers shady locations and is commonly found in wooded ravines or along stream beds. A highly beneficial snake it is greenish black in color. Each scale bears a small pale green or white spot. It occasionally eats other snakes, even poisonous ones, hence the name king snake. The color and marking of the harmless prairie king snake are quite different from those of its relatives. It is pale brown with a series of large, irregular brown blotches, each bordered by a narrow rim of black. Its chief food appears to be rats and mice. It is a burrower, at home in the agricultural land, in open fields and meadows. While the farmer may not know or appreciate it, the prairie king snake is one of his most valuable tenants. The blue racer suffers from many myths and legends. Though active and nervous, it's non-poisonous and harmless. The upper surface of the adult is a bluish or dark olive green. Most snakes cannot move much faster than a man walks, 
The Blue Racer may go a little faster, but only for a short distance, provided the terrain favors him. Despite this fact, the Blue Racer is not guilty of chasing people. This is a juvenile Blue Racer. By the end of its second gear, a bluish cast on its tail region develops and gradually spreads up to cover the blotches. The common or banded water snake is harmless, but is often confused with the true water moccasin or cottonmouth. Not every snake with flat, broad head is poisonous. The head of this non-poisonous water snake proves that there is no such simple rule for identifying a dangerous snake at a glance. Note the round eye pupil and the absence of a pit, characteristics of our harmless snakes. Puzzle. Find the snake. Commonly measuring about two feet long, the harmless little rough green snake is a good example of nature's camouflage. Though far from rare, it is not often seen. Its favorite haunts are the lush meadows and grassy fields bordered by thickets and trees into which it frequently climbs. Here it dines almost exclusively on insects. This is a dainty snake, mild-mannered and good-natured. Rather than trying for a quick getaway, it freezes when alarmed and trusts to its protective coloring. The casual observer might understandably mistake this tiny raised head for a green leaf. Sometimes when overturning stones or logs in our woodlands, we uncover a small dull brown snake with a bright yellow collar. This is the ring-necked snake found throughout the state and averaging about 10 inches in length. Turning over this harmless little fellow, we find the spotted undersurface yellow, verging on orange, and a brilliant red tail. Entirely inoffensive, almost no amount of rough handling will induce it to show any signs of bad temper. Here's a charter member of the Knothole Gang, a glossy-coated pilot black snake. Pardon me, sister. Madam Rhode Island Red doesn't like the intrusion. And that's no kiss she gave him either. He acts like he's an old hand at this egg business. Probably is. His elastic jaws have gone to work. And in the matter of a minute or two, he's succeeded in making headway. It's a slow, laborious process. Partly by pushing against the bottom of the nest, he is able to force the egg into his mouth. A snake can swallow objects several times the size of its own head. Specialized muscles and a peculiar jawbone structure permit this. Once he gets his mouth around the egg, the rest is on a downhill grade. Now it's a matter of swallowing. Expansion of the skin separates the scales from each other, giving the snake a somewhat speckled, striped appearance. Just look at the difference between the size of his head and the swallowed egg. Talk about having a lump in your throat. Slow muscular action forces the egg down to the stomach. Then he'll constrict and crush the shell, making this meal much more digestible. He's capable of eating several at one sitting. And with eggs costing what they do on the market today, one might think that the snake would be an expensive guest in a year's time. But there's two sides to a story. Here's our old friend, the pilot, again. And still hanging around the barn, this time atop a feed sack. Maybe he's expecting company. Something has been a regular visitor to this neighborhood, that's sure. And from all appearances, we'd say that it was that filthy, destructive character, the rat. Man's worst mammal enemy, rats cost us millions of dollars annually in eating grain, feed, and poultry, and in property damage, not to mention their menace to human life by spreading diseases. The black snake seems to smell or sense something.
And here it is. With several lightning thrusts, the snake has stunned the rat. Holding his victim immobile, his powerful coil stopped the heart action of the rat. A rodent-eating snake is far more efficient than any dog or cat because it can seek out the rats and mice in their hiding places. He waits until the rat ceases to struggle and then starts to eat. Must be hungry because he's going after this dish quite rapidly, actually crawling around it. And he still maintains a grip on the rat's hindquarters just in case. Moving toward the hole, maybe he intends to polish off this snack more comfortably elsewhere. Or perhaps he figures there's more where this came from. Well, what do you think? Is the snake beneficial or not? Weigh the damage done by the prolific rat against the loss of a few eggs. If you want effective protection like this, it's yours for a little of nothing but tolerance. A lot of people do believe that snakes are worth seeing, worth knowing, and worth protecting from people who do not understand them. Do you?